Thank you, Julio, for that. It's kind. Um, I'm not so sure what to make of being different than you, because that makes me think that, given how you all know Julio, how creative and how smart he is, that probably means that I'm at the polar opposite. <clears throat> and uh, that makes me nervous, but that's okay. Uh, this, this picture I'm going to explain to you, because it's relevant to robophobia, what I'm going to talk about, which is the future of work and the advent of the age of robots. Uh, you know the New Yorker, if you didn't see the cover, um, it's self-explanatory. This is a uh, lithograph from a book in 1829 when the pundits, the philosophers of that day, the economists of that day, there were lots of economists then, and policymakers were very worried about the effect of industrialization and mechanization on the workforce of the world. And you can see how they illustrated it. So it's not a, it's not a profoundly new idea when engineers create revolutions. So I'm going to talk at a very high level about how uh, engineers create revolutions. In fact, um, I have to say that in a, in a, in a very real way, the, uh, you know, it's a pleasure and honor to talk to you all because you, you all represent how the revolutions have happened and are happening now. In fact, I'll digress very briefly to pointing to a, my favorite aphorism. So I'm going to basically be doing forecasts. Forecasting is sort of the business of being in a venture fund. Forecasting is what you do in policy. Uh, forecasting is what you do when you, when you write. Um, we all sort of implicitly and explicitly forecast, especially about technologies. It's buried in a lot of the operational behaviors of our society, which is pretty normal. <clears throat> My favorite, and there's lots of things that have been said about forecasting. Some of them are not very kind, and appropriately so. But my favorite aphorism about forecasting was from Dennis Gabor, who is a physicist. I'm a physicist, so I reveal my bias. But uh, he, wrote a, he wrote a book, and he created the phrase back in 19, uh, let's see, it was 64. And, it was, and he said this, and the book was essentially titled this, you can't predict the future, but you can invent it. Just, just kind, of, kind of true, and, and it's, kind of, it's a nice, nice distillation. And one of the most important consequences of human inventiveness is its impact on the nature of work. So the need to work, and the value of work, uh, the quality of work, the availability of work, these are the kinds of things that have been of central importance, not just to philosophers and writers, but the policymakers for essentially all of recorded history. This is, a, this is not a new, a new challenge, a new idea. And the idea that technology creates both positive and negative impacts, that's that's not new, right? It's, uh, and the idea that technology is what drives productivity, and productivity is what drives economies, that's not new. But we have a new thing going on now, and it's the idea that we're facing peak jobs. You've seen this written many places. The y-axis is the total number of people employed in the United States. And the forecast a lot of people are putting out is that in the United States and a lot of the Western world, we are facing an imminent future when the total number of people that are employed or employable will peak. At, uh, this is not what's being talked about in business circles, by the way. In the business circles, what people are worried about is a shortage of skilled labor. And not just a shortage of skilled labor, but a shortage of people available to and willing to work at all. But in the pundit, in the pundit or the punditocracy, if you like, in the intellectual circles of a forecasting, the basic thesis now is that we are facing productivity gains from algorithms, artificial intelligence, and robotics that are so powerful that for the first time, labor saving, which by definition is what productivity is, labor saving will be so powerful as to eliminate the need for most labor. So you know how the thesis goes. You've heard, you've heard it in various forms. It's essentially that we go from a society that was agrarian, that where productivity drove us to the farms, then Productivity drove people from the farms into manufacturing, then from manufacturing into services. But this time, as productivity way, sweeps through all those sectors, there's nowhere else to go. There's no place for people who are put out of work to go to find work in the next, eco, the next revolution, the next cycle of the ecosystems of society. So you hear in policy circles the proposal that we create universal basic incomes right, for people who are just endemically and permanently unemployable. Well, we've been there before. Uh, there's been a lot of times in history uh, that 
the notion of universal basic income has been proposed. Um, notably, and I'll just name one of them, by President Kennedy and President Johnson in the early 1960s. President Kennedy created an Office of Automation and Manpower within the Department of Labor back in the early 1960s because of rampant concerns that automation would eliminate most work, a lot of work. He proposed that Congress should fund training programs and fund readjustment allowances for displaced workers. And shortly after that, in 1964, President Johnson convened the Blue Ribbon Commission on the impact of automation on work, and that commission recommended specifically that the government think about creating a universal basic income. Well, it's, you know, it's tempting to dismiss uh, the concerns that they had half a century ago. It's amazing, right? It's sort of quaint and naive, I mean, by our modern standards. I mean, it, but it's hard to keep, in, it's important to keep in mind that at that time, automation on Detroit's assembly lines was already displacing labor, the workforce was decreasing, even as output increased because of automation, because of robotics. It's, um, it's kind of hard to, to, to put yourself into the, in the end of the time, either to remember it if you were of age, or to think about it if you study history, but the psychological impact of the pace of technology change at that time was really quite remarkable in the early 60s. I mean, society at that time had just witnessed in the last couple of decades uh, technological miracles that just seemed to come fast and furious. That was right on the tail end of the advent of commercial nuclear energy and the nuclear, nuclear bomb. The first solar photovoltaic systems were deployed. Satellites were being launched and communication systems for the first time in human history. Commercial jet travel had become commercial and, and viable. The transistor had been invented. It was being commercialized. The laser had been invented. Color television was invented and becoming commercialized. And that was the advent of the commercialization of the, quote, thinking machine. Computers became practical and began to, to show up in offices and universities. So America in Kennedy's time also, it's a relevant parallelism, had just come out of three major recessions and the nation was in, in the middle of a productivity growth deficit. You know what this is, by the way. The bottom right is a cobot which is, wasn't called a cobot then because they didn't have Peshkin and Colgate to name it. But that's what, that's what Hughes Aircraft had invented in 1961, uh, demonstrating how this cobot, typical of male engineers, is zipping up a woman's dress. But that's, and of course, the, the, this is a robot vacuum, a lawnmower, which was invented in 1959. And naturally, again, we have a woman mowing the lawn. But of course, the people who buy robot vacuums today are men, not women. But that's, again. So, Kennedy faced a productivity deficit when he became president. If the economy was coming out of multiple recessions. That's where we are today. We're in a productivity deficit. And we've recently emerged from one of the great recessions of history. And every, as everybody who studies economics knows this. You don't have to be an economics professor. That it takes rising productivity to create economic growth. In fact, it is the central feature of economies that's critical to drive economic growth. Solo got his Nobel Prize, as you all know, in economics for creating a formulation for uh, mathematically linking the productivity and technology growth to economic growth. In fact, to briefly wax slightly philosophical, one of humanity's oldest single pursuits is inventing machines to take labor out of making products and performing tasks. It's what we have been trying to do for all of recorded and before recorded history. There's there's actually a, um, almost a theological uh, critical, criticality to this. The single most important commodity in the universe is human time. It's the amount of time, the amount of corporeal time we actually have in the universe we live in. Everybody is born until genetic engineers perform magic. But right now, it's still the case. Every human being is born with sort of a bank account of a maximum of one million corporeal hours to live. That's it. We've never managed to change that. Finding ways to make each of those hours precious, taking labor out of services and manufacturing has been the central pursuit of humanity for centuries. And it hasn't changed. It's critical. It's what engineers do. The million hours, by the way, sounds like a lot of hours, right? But like a million dollars, it's a lot till you start spending it, right? And some of us have spent more of those hours than others here, so you begin to think about how precious those hours are in your life. Because in history, there's hundreds of examples in history of uh, inventions that are 
generate profound gains in the productivity, reduce labor hours needed to perform a task, whether it's to get somewhere or to make something, to do something. You could fill books full of these examples because that's what most of what history is about. Some of history is about making weapons to damage things and kill people. Some of it's about doing entertainment. But a lot of history is really about inventing ways, machines and tools and services, to reduce labor hours, to drive productivity up. And the irony is in our era, despite the existence of the likes of Amazon, Uber, and Apple, we still sit at a productivity deficit. That's what this graph shows you. This is the average annual productivity growth in the United States since 1956. There's two questions here that are obvious, right? We're in a productivity deficit. Is that deficit permanent? I mean, is this for the first time in human history? Like everything else, things sort of cycle, that we're never going to cycle back up? Obviously not. I mean, obviously, you can't make the case that this is the end of productivity gains, because that's like making the case it's the end of innovation, the end of technology. The impact of getting productivity back, not to dwell on this, but to be practical or look at the policy or social implications, easy to illustrate. If we got a little bit of growth and productivity again, if we have technology that drives productivity back up, we get economic growth. If we return to the long run average of 3.5% GDP growth, and by that I mean the long run, long run average of the last century, more or less, the impact of that on our near future is rather dramatic. Growing at CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, and most economists are operating on the basis of thinking the economy will grow at about 2% per year average GDP growth rate. If we re re return to the norm of 3.5% in the year 2028, roughly 10 years out, right? Roughly 10, but the U.S. economy would be $3.6 trillion bigger than it would otherwise be at the lower growth rate. And that's like adding the economies of Texas and California together to the United States over the next decade. This is a profound difference in the magnitude of money available in, the, in our economy. Money doesn't solve all problems, and money doesn't fix stupid. But money solves a lot of problems. When you struggle in societies, a lot of the kind of social challenges we face and the battles we face in politics are driven by constrained availability to, to spend the money to, to solve problems. A lot of economists might agree that we can get back to 3.5% GDP growth rate, but there's a whole cabal of economists now that are saying we might get there, and you might actually get this extra $3.5 trillion, but you'll get it with fewer people working. You're going to get more growth this time by having more productivity but less labor, more unemployment. They're saying, in effect, this time it's different. It's different than it's been in 130 years of recorded history. We, we know two things about the last 130 years, or really the last century and a half in the United States, and it's true for the Western world. First, we know that over that long time period, there have been continual, serial, and profound improvements and changes in technologies added to the U.S. economy. You, can, you don't have to work hard to think of long lists of things that have profoundly changed the productivity of U.S. manufacturing and services in those 130 years. We know another thing, which this graph shows, is that despite all this labor saving, that's what productivity is, and despite population growth has added more labor seekers to the economy, 95% of people who have sought to work have continued to be employed over all that history. If labor saving productivity permanently killed employment, then there's no possibility that the average unemployment rate for 130 years would be oscillating around 5%. Obviously something happened because the people were employed and there were more people being employed than in the past. Of course there were uh, recessions over that time. Unemployment spiked briefly at different times. But at no point in those times could you put a finger on technology as causing those recessions, those unemployment spikes. In every case, they were caused by mismanagement, stupidity, or bad policies, not by engineers inventing technologies to take labor out of things. But now, now today, the essence of the argument is our future, our future is different. This time, again, this is the, this is the word that all failed forecasters use. The phrase is always the same. This time, it's different. Well, they're sort of right. You have to know what's different about this time. I and mean, the robots are different. The automation is different this time. It's true. 
I mean, there's really two classes if you want to, want to just be simplistic of, of robots. There are the virtual robots, that's the code in the cloud. And then there are physical robots. This is when code actually operates and animates machines. Robots, physical auto automatons. In the first case, the code in the cloud, we, we, we have now a couple of years, we're about two or three years into the resuscitation of an old phrase that most computer scientists purged from their lexicon for a couple decades, artificial intelligence. It was a phrase created by computer scientist McCarthy at Dartmouth in 1955 in a proposal to do a workshop on, as he called it for the first time in known history, artificial intelligence. He put the idea forward five years after Alan Turing had written an essay on artificial intelligence, which was five years after Van Avra Bush wrote in 1945 part of, what his, what, part of his writings about the prospect and the benefits of artificial intelligence. So it's, it's been resuscitated as a, as a uh, respectable idea in computing science. It was considered not very respectable because for most of the decades following McCarthy's workshop and Turing's writings, all of the benefits promised by scientists or the dystopian outcomes threatened by science fiction writers, none of them happened. Again, it's hard to put yourself in the context of the 1960s, but thinking machines were a big deal at a time when they had never existed before. We have better thinking machines today than you had before. We have better airplanes than they had. But to go from an air with no airplanes, if you like, to an air with aircraft is a bigger deal, I would argue, they're going from an aircraft, air, air, era of aircraft that are propeller driven to jet propelled. We've got jet propelled and soon we'll have supersonic computers, so to speak. But it was a big deal to live in an era when you went from the idea of a thinking machine, which was 1939, the first electronic computer, University of Illinois, I believe, to the first useful computer, which is what Turing built and others, to actually even the first commercial computer in the late 50s and early 60s, UNIVAC and, and others that were produced by IBM. But a lot of people today use artificial intelligence and don't know it. A lot of businesses use it and do know it, but you know what artificial intelligence is. When you use Siri or, or Amazon Echo, when you use Google Map, uh, when you search for movies on Netflix, when you buy stuff at Amazon, you're using an AI engine. We're, we're in early days of useful artificial intelligence in the consumer field, and we're in very early days at useful artificial intelligence, virtual robots for industrial purposes. And as for cyber physical systems, you know, the real robots that can move and, and not just talk to you, but move stuff and move people. We've had those for a long time too. And that's what Kennedy was worried about. He was worried about robots eliminating jobs, and they did eliminate jobs on the assembly line. Uh, there's hundreds of thousands of, of cyber physical systems, mostly found in auto factories and the computer assembly lines. There's just started to break out of uh, those sort of cloistered, idealized domains now. I mean, they're showing up in other spaces. They're showing up notably, uh, occasionally, by the dozens on the highways, you know, robocars that are starting to drive themselves. Not so well, not very far. Uh, so far, very, frankly, very poorly. Not to digress, the fatality rate for robocars at the moment is far worse than for human beings, including human beings that are drunk driving too fast and driving a bald tire. So we, we have a ways to go to have robocars beat inebriated freshmen. Um, we'll, we'll eventually get there. It turns out it's a harder problem than people think. In fact, there's no question right now, if you think about the domains that you all probably study, I think we can now make the case that we really are on the cusp of truly practical cyber physical systems and virtual robotic systems. They're, they are no longer notional. We have real ones showing up. And that animates, that, that fact, and when you see them in venture worlds, we see them in news, we see them in, not just in science fiction, but really you've seen the videos of Boston Dynamics backflipping anthropomorphic robot. If you haven't, you know, Google it and find it. Pretty impressive stuff. When you see those things, it really does animate this, this, this new thesis that, again, we, went, we went, had an era that went from farming that got automated, and those farmers who lost their jobs had a place to go. They went to factories. But now we're going to automate those factories and put them into services. We're going to automate services that are going to have nowhere to go. So the basic thesis is that robots are going to create unemployment because manufacturing is going to follow farming. 
essentially the thesis. We will see in the future as many people employed in manufacturing as we do in farming for the same kind of structural reasons. Something wrong with that thesis. I mean, it's, what's wrong with the thesis is that it's fundamentally wrong thesis, and it's wrong for a variety of reasons, but let's start with sort of one fact set that's worth keeping in mind of what's wrong with the thesis that manufacturing, and we'll get to services in a minute, will follow the trajectory of farming as a percentage of employment in America. Because basically underlying the thesis is the notion that manufacturing is not as important as it used to be in the economy, and it's becoming less important by the day. Other things are far more important. So let's just start with this fact to deconstruct that theme, is that this is the thing that you should know, and this is what Alexander Hamilton knew when he wrote and he said, and you see the quote, right, that the wealth and prosperity of a nation is materially connected to the prosperity or the health of its manufacturing sector. The United States has had more people employed in services and in manufacturing since colonial times for all of America's history. There have never been more people as a percentage of the population working in factories and in services. Yes, the, fa the agricultural jobs went away, but the notion that manufacturing and services have flipped their relationship is not true. The question is, what caused a long decline in jobs on farms? Well, we know the answer. Farming got more productive, and it got more productive faster than demand grew for food. So if you do the math, this is a very, a very simple calculation, you end up with fewer labor hours needed to produce, because you had labor hour improvement going down faster than demand was going up. The reality is the demand for food is known, the future demand for food at any given time is known within reasonably tight boundaries, very limited, and with relatively small growth rates, where very, thus very modest improvements in labor productivity and farming can reduce the absolute demand for labor and farming because the demand can't grow fast. This is not the case in manufacturing. This is not the case with things. Even large increases in manufacturing productivity will lead to increases in labor and manufacturing. Because to put it simplistically, slightly hyperbolically, the potential demand for things that can be manufactured is infinite, not limited and bounded. This is the food thing. This one's easy, right? If you wanted to guess how many people you need to, to farm, how much food you have to make, how many labor hours you need, you need to know just two variables. The population growth rate, which is known with remarkable precision for all nations for very long time periods, remarkable precision, and how many calories people can consume in a day. The difference between subsistence living and, to put it unkindly, gluttony, right? we, we consider ourselves gluttons compared to the, it's just twofold. Now, in big picture terms, when it comes to productivity gains, a 2x is nothing. We can get 2x gains in productivity over a 50-year period with sleeping. You'd have to be a terrible engineer not to get 2x gains in productivity in 50 years. So productivity gains in, in making agricultural stuff can drive labor demand down rapidly because there just isn't a lot of room for demand growth in food. The world is awash in food. Distribution of food is a problem, but the actual challenge, the actual key variable to understand, to know about the future labor demand in manufacturing, which we're staying on for a minute, is not the productivity gains, but the demand potential. How much faster can demand go for stuff that has to be fabricated? We actually know something about this. Let's look at a mature economy, not an economy where people don't have anything. We know what the demand growth possibilities are in economies that don't have anything. It's enormous. Right? The percentage of people in the world that have a car, the numbers are actually the inverse of the West. There's about 800 cars per thousand human beings in the West, counting babies, right? people who can't and shouldn't drive. Right? There's about 700 cars per one human being for five billion people in the world. So the number of air conditioners that exist in the world are about one hundredth the demand for air conditioning in the world. The number of chairs, the number of computers. You can name any common existing product. The demand for those things globally is 10 to 100 fold higher than the current manufacturing levels for those existing things. And as those nations become wealthier, they'll, they'll, they will buy those things. They will have to be fabricated. No one that I am aware of proposes that the manufacturing productivity gains that are in sight 
are as big as the magnitude of demand gains for the stuff that we have to manufacture. We're talking 10 to 100 fold gains in demand for existing stuff. So you look at, the, look at the United States, what we're not seeing is an increase in demand for existing stuff though. This is the second part of the equation. This is an increase in demand for stuff that didn't exist before. Engineers didn't create demand. E economists don't like that. They like to think demand is created by all sorts of these variables that relate to supplying needs at different prices. All true about things that never existed before. It is obvious to say that there was no demand for plastics before chemists invented plastics. There was no demand for aircraft until we invented aircraft. There was no demand for computers until we invented computers. When computers first came on the scene, there were only 100,000 people in the United States involved in manufacturing computers. There's almost a million today. And the million people that are manufacturing computers today are hundreds of times more productive than the 100,000 people who were manufacturing computers in the 1960s. The chemistry, chemical industry is the same way. There were about 100,000 people in the chemical industry at the turn of the last century, in the early 1900s. There's about a million people in the chemical industry today the productivity per person in the chemical industry today is astoundingly higher than it was in the early 1900s. So the labor force went up, not despite the increase of productivity, but because of it. This is a concept difference that people in the economics community forget. Increasing productivity reduces the cost of the thing. If the thing is something people want, the demand for it goes up. All you have to know is whether the demand can grow faster than the improvement in labor productivity. With food, we know the answer is no. With things, we know the answer is yes, it can. But more importantly, when you see in the United States, this is the US population for the last half century, you can see the agricultural consumption is essentially tracked population growth. Unsurprising in a mature economy when our caloric intake per person was already well beyond subsistence 50 years ago. But the consumption inside the domestic United States of industrial kinds of things went up 350% more than the population. All that stuff has to be manufactured, produced, and moved. It requires labor hours. The labor hours actually got better by nearly 300% over that time period. So manufacturing employment didn't grow much. But have we finished inventing things? Well, obviously not. I mean, if you think about the things that have yet to be invented, let me refer you. you can't think of things that have yet to be invented that can't be imagined. So the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, let's just use that as an example. Uh, which was a pretty interesting time. The world was a light in innovation. No one imagined the radio in 1893. It was a few years later, Marconi performed the trick and then RCA commercialized the radio. R RCA's uh, stock, by the way, if you go back and look at its history, went up more and faster than any tech company has in recent years. People made 10,000% of their money in three years on RCA stock. You, people became millionaires because RCA commercialized the radio very quickly. No one imagined the radio that would need to be manufactured, nor, nor the entire ecosystem around radios that was required, broadcasting stations, and all the kind of businesses and services that were attended to the radio. You can't imagine what you can't imagine, right? But we can imagine how much manufacturing might be associated with things that have already been invented that don't exist in wide-scale production. Obvious examples include drones. There's probably going to be a lot more drones in the future. The whole domain of chemistry is undergoing a, a revolution of computational material science, graphene, metamaterials. None of these things are made in volume. All of them will one day be made in volume. It'll be an industry possibly as big as chemistry is today. The bioelectronics and transient electronics industry, which is one that's being pioneered here in Northwestern, that industry, I'm confident, will be bigger than the silicon electronics industry at some point in the future. The silicon electronics industry is a $3 trillion global industry, which didn't exist 100 years ago, and employs people today. There's lots of examples. And let's use the robot, the, my favorite example, because we, I like robots. I think we all like robots. Anthropomorphic, the, the holy grail of the general purpose anthropomorphic robot that we can all have, just like, oh, let's see, a general purpose car. There's no reason in principle and in due course we will eventually figure out how to make a general purpose affordable anthropomorphic robot. Would people want them? Well, I, th I think they probably will. Uh, not inconceivable, a lot of people would want them. It's not inconceivable, many people would want them as they want cars. The automobile industry didn't exist before 1900 or 1890 and change. It's a $10 trillion industry today. The automobile industry will still exist when there's robots because we're not going to jump on the back of Robbie the robot to get carried from A to B. We're still gonna drive a car maybe with a robot in the back. Possibly the robot will drive the car with us. Hard to say which way it'll be. But either way, we'll manufacture it. It won't matter what we're manufacturing, whether it's a trivial thing like 
virtual, 3D virtual reality games are important, things like lasers, they'll all be manufactured. A lot of these things haven't been invented yet. They will be invented. The things that have been invented, if they're useful and get cheap, they'll be produced in volume. Engineers invent and create needs. Now, they don't create the kind of needs that are fundamental human nature. We like to eat, we like to have entertainment, we like to go places more quickly. Those are basic, we don't invent those needs. But human beings satisfy those constellation of needs we have for entertainment, and comfort, and safety in a lot of different ways. They all get manufactured. So you have 3D printing ideas and, and the flying cars. I think uh, the whole separate lecture, I think long before we see self-driving cars, we're gonna see self-flying taxis. They're far easier to build, they're far easier to regulate, far easier to deploy. There's a whole lot of features and they're far more useful, frankly, because they unlock an unmet need, which is speed. Self-driving cars don't change much. Self-driving cars don't make enough of an improvement over the car the way the car made an improvement over a horse. But a flying car, which has always been laughed at by forecasters, really does meet a need because it is it's profoundly more time efficient than driving on the surface. I put a spaceship in here because if we ever really get the commercial space travel at volumes, this is a very manufacturing intensive industry. It ha also happens to be a pretty in energy intensive industry as, as well. It's, uh, launching a rocket like this is uh, 45 gigawatts of power, by the way. Just have, for those of you who know power, I mean a gigawatt's a nuclear power plant. One launch is uh, 45 gigawatts. So what does this mean though, I just in a practical sense? This is what it means in a practical sense. We, we divide our economy into these three sort of simplistic buckets of farming and, and services and manufacturing. I understand why we do it because it's useful. We like to have groups of threes. The three is a magic thing. But it's actually a useless uh, categorization. The taxonomy has no meaning. It has no meaning because for a very simple, a very simple and practical reason. There is a greater difference between a hospital and a retail store between those two of those things and let's say a construction of a highway than there is between, or as much difference between all three of those themselves and a farm or a factory. They're all profoundly different activities, employ very different kinds of skill sets and tools and machines and services. So when you break out the U.S. economy in the top 12 sectors, which the Bureau of Labor Statistics does, you find that this is what it looks like. And the biggest single sector of the U.S. economy is manufacturing and it's 50% bigger than the second biggest sector, which is professional services, like designing computers and designing cars and designing systems. That's a big business, uh, but it's not as big as manufacturing. There are other businesses that we do, but all of them are derivatively, if you, you state the obvious, in fact supported, as Alexander Hammond has said, by manufacturing. Uber requires cars to be manufactured and servers to be manufactured. Nanny Grove wrote a lot his, his, his last years before he died, after he left, Intel about this close symbiotic relationship between the two, the two businesses that we so-called separated, services and manufacturing. That somehow it was okay to have the manufacturing done remotely, but have the design done locally. It's not okay, it doesn't work very efficiently, both for human nature reasons, but also because of the symbiotic nature, what manufacturing is really about. Also, the other part, not to digress on manufacturing is, uh, sector, but you all know that 45% of U.S. exports are manufactured exports, and 75% of all U.S. R&D is, private sector R&D, is undertaken by the manufacturing sector. So if you're a policymaker and you thought about these things, you might actually care about manufacturing. You might actually be important. In fact, it might be particularly important to think about how to get productivity going into the manufacturing sector, because the manufacturing sector productivity has been lagging for a decade. It's been stuck in low and not changing significantly. In fact, the manufacturing sector, to the extent it's lost jobs, it has not lost jobs because robots have taken them. Artificial intelligence has taken them. That's not what happened. We know it's not what happened because the manufacturing sector is underinvested in both those categories. We know this in a lot of different ways, but this is one measure. The IT spending as a share of total expenses for different industries. If you look at this stack, what you'll notice about it is that the ratio is pretty much five to one difference, five-fold increase in, in spending on IT as a percentage of total spending by a business. But you'll notice at the top are mostly information-centric things. And at the bottom are mostly the hardware things and the hard things to do with literally physically hard hardware and hard things to do in a society and an economy. The manufacturing of chemicals, and energy, and construction, underinvested by a factor of three to five-fold below what the information-centric industries do. There's a reason for that. 
it's easier to automate, it's easier to bring artificial intelligence to bits than it is to atoms. The cyber physical stuff is harder. It's not because these businesses are stupid and don't know they should do these things. They just know that they aren't good enough yet. There are now sensors, control systems, artificial intelligence with low latency. All these things are now getting good enough, fast enough, that we're gonna be, we are beginning to see systems that can be applied to the more difficult domains, the cyber physical domains, the manufacturing domains, the supply chain domains, mining. That's all beginning, it's beginning now. It's also beginning to happen in the, uh, the, the physical robot, the, cyber, the fiber physical systems, the blue collar bots, if you like. The interesting thing about blue collar bots, robots, is where they're being used so far and have been used for the last half century. Two sectors have utterly dominated the purchase of robots, automated systems. Uh, auto automobiles, manufacturing, and, and electronics, primarily computing manufacturing. There's a reason for that. When you make those things, uh, I don't know if you've ever been on a, a, a factory line. I, my first job was in manufacturing semiconductors, uh, and I used to um, do troubleshooting on the fab. And then I got involved in automobile manufacturing. I've been in, I've been in a lot of different factories. Uh, there's two kinds of factories, there's, there's, simplistically. There's factories like automobile factories or electronics factories, where you have a very clean, controlled environment with lots of repeated, simple, straightforward tasks. And then you have everything else, which is messy, complex, amorphous, changing, and dynamic. In a chemical industry, for example, making materials, really messy, uh, very hard to automate those things. And so as a consequence, you find, you, we find, unsurprisingly, automation came first to what was easy. This is, as uh, high school kids would say, no duh, right? So you start there. Interesting fact for you, last year was the first time more, more robots, more industrial robots were purchased outside of the top two sectors than in them. So up until 2016, the majority of purchases were in the automotive and electronic sector. Last year, for the first time, it tipped over. I think that's a bellwether of the beginning of practical robots automation in the difficult domains, which has profound implications for productivity because the only reason you buy a robot is to be more productive. You don't spend money on a robot in order to make less money. You spend money on a robot to make more money, which in manufacturing, the single most important material input, cost input you have, typically, is the human labor. You want to switch that out. You want to switch it out not because you want to fire people. It's because you want to make the thing cheaper and better, which again, to go back to a previous point I was trying to make, is that in domains where demand grows faster than productivity means more jobs. It can mean fewer jobs in any specific company or any specific country, depending on policies, but at the macro level, it means more jobs. Services, other big, by, by definition, are services, setting aside the fact that services are very disparate in nature, there's a lot of kinds of services, bringing robots to services. It turns out it's just as hard as bringing robots to the manufacturing sector. This um, video clip of the Boston Dynamics Robodog is one of my favorite because uh, obviously the engineer got a little afraid. He, he, thought <laughs> he, he probably thought that somebody you know, wrote a piece of bad code and was about to come after him, so he's jumping back. <laughs> so Boston Dynamics makes some very uh, uh, spooky looking anthropomorphic robots and they're, they're really quite remarkable. Uh, I, think, I think we'll begin to see practical robots uh, in service sector very soon. Maybe the most relevant kind of practical robot in the bottom is, is a self-driving, not car, but a self-driving wheelchair, uh, which is actually a pretty useful thing. If you, think, if you don't have to think very long and hard, if you could make a really useful, intelligent self-driving wheelchair that didn't drive the passenger, of course, into objects, I mean, it's a, it's a non-trivial problem, but to make it is kind of useful. It doesn't put people out of work because, on average, there aren't enough people willing to push wheelchairs around, whether it's airports or anywhere else. It's actually be an enabling productivity driving tool in this sort of that, that broad sense of the word. Service industries are desperately in need of productivity. And productivity, to state it again, comes from new technology, especially robots and, and artificial intelligence. This is the productivity change in digital industries over the last uh, 15 years in the physical industries and in healthcare. As you can see, the physical industries, as I mentioned, stalled out in the last four, five, six years, which is bad. I think it's going to come back. Now the reason it's stalled out, just as an aside, is it's not just that the systems, tend, the systems that are useful tend to go through episodes of utility. So uh, there's one factor, which is that the systems for most physical industries were not worth buying until around now. So most of the people who were willing to buy automation bought the automation. So the rest of the industrial sector wasn't buying automation 
So the average went flat. Just think of it. So the car guys just can't buy that much more automation. The rest of them are only beginning to buy it now. I think that starts ticking up. The healthcare industry, though, has, has been absolutely flat. There's been no increase in output of the healthcare industry per labor hour. It, it, you could take this graph back further. It actually looks worse than this if you go back further in time. This is one sector in desperate need of artificial intelligence and automation across the entire ecosystem. I recognize it's hard to bring it there, but it's obviously in desperate need of it because the thing about productivity is that it has one magic effect which is very easy to measure. It lowers costs. Right, so we can, we can actually run another graph, which I won't show you, which is the change in cost of services versus the change in cost of goods over this time period. Would you be surprised to know, you wouldn't be surprised to know, that if I give you a graph of the change in cost of services over the last 15 years, they've been going up. I mean, in fact, healthcare services and educational services, but healthcare services in general, have outpaced inflation by threefold. Physical things have either stayed flat with inflation or drip dropped 20, 30, 40, 50, and 100 percent over 15 years ago because we've had more productivity there. What we want is more productivity in these sectors. What we want is more service bots. You know, exoskeletons for a rehab, which is, if you think about healthcare productivity and the amount of money and time and labor hours that go into rehabilitation for people who have injuries or illness, this number is staggeringly large. Just something as simple as a practical exoskeleton that can facilitate and accelerate rehabilitation for injury or, or, or health, health injuries or physical injuries would be profoundly productive. There is one, one, I think this is, I forgot the vendor. They just received FDA approval for this exoskeleton for, re, for purposes of re rehab, rehabilitation. This is just the beginning, right? This, you know, if, I, if you just look at that as an engineer, you, the fact that they got approval for it will tell you that they were working hard not around the optimal design, optimal aesthetics, but the optimal design that could get approved, which is not, which is not Im, an immaterial point. And the, the bottom is a picture of a Japanese healthcare robot. And you, you all who tra travel to Japan and, and China know, and this, I, I do not understand the cultural uh, roots of this, but both in my travels in China and Japan, the things have these like cartoon faces like that put on robots and toys that totally different than we would do in America. I don't know why, but you, so this goofy smiling robot uh, in Japan is actually a healthcare assistant robot to do the obvious, which, which nurses and physicians have dreamt for a long time. Pick up the patient gently because it's not only a source of back injury and a high cost in, in the healthcare industry, it's an increasing need for efficiency and safety in hospitals. So this is a forecast for um, service bots, the, the, the things like the Boston Dynamics robot. Right? There's 10 million service robots were sold last year, 10 million. So it's already a real business, but almost all of those, just to, to be clear, 80% of those, you, you know what it was. It was the Roomba, or their, their imitators, it's a vacuum cleaner. But a vacuum cleaner was a, was a labor-saving device when it was invented. So a robot vacuum cleaner is just another labor-saving device. We, we, here's a, here's a, 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 a math experiment to do. Do you think that the reduction in labor hours to clean a house to go from no vacuum to vacuum was bigger or smaller than going from robo -vac not person vacuum to robo vacuum? You could think about this and do the calculation. I guarantee you, you'll conclude that the reduction in labor hours, the productivity gain in robo vacuum is less than going from no vacuum to a vacuum. So that, that's, a, that's an, improved, an improvement. It's a good gain. But it's nothing like we really want to see. So it's, it's, the first ones were easy. The other, oh, by the way, the rest, the other 20%, almost all of those were robo lawnmowers, like a better version of the goofy one I showed you from 1959. And then a few percent were, were consumer drones used for quasi, you know, they, they get thrown in the bucket of service bots. But if it's the case, and I don't think it's a crazy forecast, that we end up in another decade with 60 million service robots of various kinds, not just vacuum cleaners and lawnmowers manufactured and sold a year in the world, that's a big number. How big will that number go? I, you know, I think that's a number that we'll see the classic hockey stick curve and inflection point. Because at some point, we'll begin making service robots for service activities that are really useful and affordable, and a lot of them will get manufactured and purchased. We'll stimulate a manufacturing industry to make them, but collaterally, we'll bring productivity gains to the service sector. The X, by the way, is the number of industrial robots sold a year in uh, forecast for 2020. You can see that the, the reason 85% of all venture capital is focused on service robots, not industrial robots, is illustrated by just the spread on the scale. Uh, there's, there's money in, in industrial robots. They, they're expensive. They cost millions of dollars a piece. There's a lot more money to be made in, in selling 
something that's still expensive. Cars are expensive, right? I mean, car is the single most expensive manufactured item everybody buys that's a common citizen, other than a billionaire. The car is astonishingly complex, astonishingly expensive when you think about it. And we, we, we make $10 trillion of them a year to sell to people of any kind. I mean, it's astonishing. Uh, robots will follow that trajectory, but they will only do it when they're, let's say, roughly the cost of a car, give or take. Right? It has to get into that range, not millions of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars. The other part of the service sector that will get roboticized, so to speak, is, is, is really the easier part, which is the information system side. Bringing the virtual robot, the, the, the code in the cloud, into, into the services. We, can, we know it hasn't happened yet. We, we, I'll tell you, the reason we know that service sector productivity is flat and hasn't experienced the power of artificial intelligence and software is not just evident in the fact that the cost curves are fl flat, terrible, the costs are going up and the productivity curves are flat. It's, if you do a survey, which is what this is, by the way, and ask businesses that are using artificial intelligence in this case, because you have to define artificial intelligence carefully when you take a survey, but there are, you can imagine a useful way to define what you mean by artificial intelligence. We don't mean word processors and spreadsheets. So we, we're talking about semi-autonomous systems or fully autonomous systems that make decisions for you in the background that are software only. Take a look at where, pe where businesses report they're using it. But people don't report they're using it because they don't know they're using it. I mean, some people do. You know that when you ask Siri or you Google Map, you're using an AI engine. And when you shop for books, you're already, Amazon is, or whatever you shop for, Amazon is using AI engines. But you'll see that most artificial intelligence applications are in information areas. We still haven't broken out of pure information domains. And again, because it's actually harder. You know, to, to bring actual intelligence to healthcare, uh, reading x-rays, despite the uh, hype around AI engines that can be see, recognize a cat's face in your face and cancer, this, if, you, if you dive a, a little deeper into the, the literature, we, we are not reaching, you, you do not want a robot reading your, your, your x-ray films yet. Uh, this is not gonna, it's not gonna work out so well. The repeatability of these AI engines is poor. Uh, it's a bit like, remember when Google first bragged that, that they could predict where flu, the flu vector because they saw people asking about flu. There was a lot, of, a lot of hype about how the internet now makes it possible through basically data analysis of big data and AI to, to see where it flew. And it turned out that the data matched up that year, and that's why all the publicity. The data didn't match the year after or the year after. It turned out that was actually just a classic example of a rooster crowing and the sun rising, and they mistook the correlation. It wasn't, it wasn't predictive at all. So we're, but we'll get there. I mean, we've, get, we've got some very good indications. But this, I show this not because AI doesn't matter and not because it isn't powerful. And it's very useful in these particular areas already. It's that you begin where it's easy, and you go where it's hard, and you get people comfortable with it. So let me, let me um, finish up with a couple of sort of high-level pictures. Uh, do the, but will it, will it do we have any data that said it doesn't kill jobs? Right? There's, there actually are some data. I'm just doing sort of prospective. I'm just saying it won't, it won't kill jobs. doesn't mean it won't kill specific jobs. On average for the economy, it's not going to create mass unemployment. So for the period 1997 to 2012, that 15 year period, that was the dawn of the modern age of enterprise software. We began to see enterprise software systems being purchased by companies to do real stuff, whether it's Salesforce, you know, whether, whether it's Microsoft suite. That was that era. So this data taken from uh, uh, BEA looks at the change in employment in all about think, what, three dozen industries across that 15 year period based on their investment in software. And what you'll see is, the graph is obvious to you, right? You see that, that on average what you get is more jobs, not fewer, the more you invest in software. But you also see something else here, which is the important sub point, is that most of the spending by most companies in that period is below 2%, more in the 1% range of their total operating expenses on software. They're underinvested in software. And in that category, when you're, when you're marginally invested, you get a lot, of, a lot of spread, a lot of diversity. So you, it, this makes it very easy sort of cherry pick outcomes. You can easily find a company with a modest investment in software, fired a lot of people. And you can just as easily find somebody with a very modest investment in software that hired a lot of people. I show the two obvious examples, of apparel and mining. But statistically, the statistics here, and in other studies like this, very strongly support that as you increase your spending in software in an industry, you actually end up 
hiring more people. That's because, again, to, to, to restate the tautology, you only buy the software if you really believed it was going to make you more competitive and productive. Which means that you're more competitive and productive means you typically hire more people, not fewer people. It makes you more competitive in your ecosystem and, and around the world. That's the point of buying it. You don't buy it because you think it's going to cause you to become less competitive or, or because you think you're going to fire people. Most managers don't like firing people. So let me, um, before I conclude, let me just spend one minute on STEM and jobs, on another canard that's been offered in this giant scheme that robots are going to not only replace all work, but the work that's left will be for people who are the, quote, knowledge workers. This is a very popular thesis in Silicon Valley. And they're the ones that are promulgating heavily the idea that we need a universal basic income for all those hapless people who don't have degrees like we all have in this room. And you're just an unlucky slob that got a PhD in philosophy. You're obviously going to have to get a universal basic income. One of my sons has a PhD in philosophy, by the way. He is gainfully employed. And he's, I would say, certainly, certainly smarter than I am. So, because he got a PhD in philosophy and I didn't. <laughs> so, but here, here's, the, here's the problem with the thesis that STEM work is, is going to replace all jobs or it's going to be the, the, the sine qua non of the future. Obviously, I and you, we all believe this STEM education matters. I like engineers and scientists. I worked as both. Uh, it's important to our economy. We need more of them. So from 1960 to, to today, we've increased the number of people employed as engineer or scientists a lot, from 1 million to almost 8 million. This is a big increase. And that big increase has meant that the share of people employed as engineers and scientists has tripled over that time period, because there's been population growth at the same time. So you've tripled the share. But you know, you know that you, this is arithmetic. Increasing a, a, a tiny number, I increasing a lot, still leaves you a tiny number. The share of people who are employed in STEM in America is still about 6%. That's it. Now, it's not nothing. It's more than it used to be. But 6% is not, it's not, the, it's not where most people are going to get their jobs. And it's a fiction to tell people that you're going to have to get a STEM degree to get a job, because 6% of jobs are STEM jobs today in the, in the United States of America. Uh, a more specific example, since convincing both kids and, and retired people to learn how to code, because everybody needed to be a coder, right? If you weren't a coder, you, you're a loser. You couldn't get a job. I used to know how to code. I don't know how to code anymore. The code I wrote would operate an IBM 360, which, you know, there might be one operating in a museum somewhere. So I stopped writing code because, well, you know, I was okay at it. I had a math major, too. It's not, it's not, it's a discipline. But here's the fact for you. You know that there are more people in, employed in the agriculture and farming community than there are coders. I mean, there aren't many farmers left in America. There's about the same number of coders. Now, we need them both. It's not like I denigrate either one of them. We need food and we need code. Uh, but the, we're not going to see the world uh, dominated by STEM. But STEM competency, STEM sophistication, that matters. That's an educational challenge. There's no question about that. But if you ask a company, and Google did this in an internal study, which they published recently, this, uh, I think early this year, they wanted to find out about what, what were the characteristics of their employees that determined whether they were on a good career track. Because if you're an employer, you want to encourage people on a good career track. They, di they did not find any correlation with respect to their degree, right? that whether they were a better or worse engineer, a better GPA. What they found correlation with was all non-STEM skills, 100% correlation with non-STEM skills. Creativity, uh, they could get along, they were a problem solver, they were a communicator, they could write. You know, you, know the, you know the list. Julio's probably told you this list before, once, once or twice. I mean, this is, this is the list of things that determines the success they found in, the, in a very detailed study of their employee track. Unsurprising to, to really what you stated. Not that it's not important that we will have more knowledge workers, but let me let, let, let end on with one more sort of knowledge worker fact. But here's the thing that engineers are really good at. So engineers are really good at making things better and cheaper. Right? That's what engineers do. That's your job, if, whatever you're in. But the other thing that engineers are, are masters at is making things that are complicated become easier to use. Because if you do that, more people will use it. This is sort of another tautology. Well, what happens if you make things easier to use? Let's say if the thing you're making easier to use is artificial intelligence, a cobot. What you're doing is if you have an intelligent virtual assistant that's easy to use, I have just raised the average IQ of America up. I've made everybody a knowledge worker eas more easily. That's the path we're on. We're, we're on a path to sort of creating sort of intelligent virtual assistants that are truly useful, creating more knowledge workers. This is a good thing. This will increase productivity of the economy. 
It doesn't mean that if you didn't win or lose the genetic lottery or the lottery where you were born, the so-called zip code lottery, that you're a loser. Uh, practical artificial intelligence raises everybody's. So last slide I want to show you is this sort of this notion where I want to leave you with this thought. We, something is different today. We, we, are, we are at a pivot in history. Technologies don't change in smooth linear orders. They go through sort of great episodes of takes years to make something work. Then all of a sudden, the inflection happens. It looks like the inflection happened overnight. It never happens overnight. It takes decades of hard work, development of practical systems and knowledge, and infrastructure, and domain capabilities. And then once those happen, the infrastructures around those new things just take off. This is a, a, a map of the growth of networks in the United States, in this case, but you can see it around the world, and how fast they grew and went to, from zero, if you like, to maximum or nominal maximum network size. They happen very fast. And the idea that things are happening faster today, actually the canal system got built faster than our road system, just, just so you know. And they built that with shovels and mules. So the idea that we're somehow moving faster, I think, is not entirely true. But particularly with infrastructures, it's not true. We are in the tipping point of two new infrastructures. We're in early days of the virtual robot, which is the code in the cloud, that infrastructure. And we're in very early days of the infrastructures associated with cyber physical systems. In fact, to, to, to finish with sort of the automobile analogy, because I think we're sort of in an age a lot like the early 1900s, where you had a confluence of things, the development of chemistry, the university systems that existed at the time, electricity and, and internal combustion, those modern steels, that all came together. It was a, it was a magic sort of confluence. We're at the same point in time. I've talked about this, I think, a year ago. But just to put this in analogous date terms, I think we're essentially at 1920 in uh, artificial intelligence and the code in the cloud. Now, 1920 is an important year, right? 1920 was a, the tipping point past the Model T. The Model A was in sight. We knew we could mass produce cars. About, we're about to. 10% of the US population had a car in 1920. And there were already 2,000 different companies that had come into existence and disappeared in the previous three decades manufacturing cars. Fortunes had already been made making cars. But the car age took off after 1920. We're sort of about 1920. By 1937, about 40% of people had cars. By 1955, it was 75%. It's 90% of people have cars now. The, the, the tipping point happened. When it comes to anthropomorphic robots, we all, you know, your personal assistant, well, you know, Danger Will Robinson, but really a nice, a nice one uh, from Lost in Space. We haven't seen the Model T yet. We haven't seen a Model T. We're, we're sort of 1893 in car terms. Uh, maybe we're in 1899, 1900, but we haven't seen the Model T yet. The, when the Model T happens, when somebody actually puts out something that looks and smells and feels like a Model T, an anthropomorphic robot used for anything, in this case it might be for firefighting, with, like D DARPA wants, then you'll, then you'll know you're, 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 you're at that beginning of the trajectory from there to the first commercial product. It's another 10 or 20 years. Right? That's how long it took the computer to go from the Model T of the computing age to the first commercial was almost 20 years. But then you know you're close to the tipping point, and that's when people start making a lot of money. And then that's when we really revolutionize productivity. And we make manufacture a lot of stuff, because I think that, that these two industries alone represent $10 trillion of manufacturing, never mind all the services and service productivity. So you all are sort of sitting at this cusp. You can see the years I put, where we're, we're about to ignite this net trade infrastructure. There's been nothing quite like it, really since the dawn of the air age, if you like, for that great infrastructure. You're creating it. It's a lot of fun to be affiliated with you because of that. And thank you for your time.